So I'd like to welcome you all here. My name is Lori Grace. I'm the executive director of Sunrise Center, and I'm here to welcome you to uh, listen to Arnie Gunderson, who's been a uh, nuclear e expert for many, many years, and uh, to educate ourselves about this very, very important topic. And uh, uh, I'm very appreciative that all of you are here. And so, um, uh, let's see, I, I actually don't have your uh, CV in front of me, but I remember that you have been an advisor to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and you are currently uh, running, maybe you should help me. Okay. You want to come up and help sure. me for a minute? <laughs> So this is Maggie. I'm Maggie Gunderson. I founded Fairwinds in 2003. Fairwinds Associates, our paralegal services and expert witness firm, and founded um, Fairwinds Energy Education in 2008. Um, Arnie and I have been married almost 37 years, and we both came from the nuclear industry. I, uh, we met when he was the lead engineer on a project, and I was in charge of public relations, telling everyone how safe the plants were. And, <laughs> and, and we were wrong. Uh, we thought that we believed in Atoms for Peace program and taking swords and putting them into plowshares and we thought that this is what that did. But um, the atom, as Arnie will talk to you about, the atomic reactor is not something that is easily controlled and it's not economically viable. Arnie has uh, bachelor degree and a master degree both in nuclear engineering and uh, has a patent, it's a nuclear safety patent. He re had an Atomic Energy Commission fellowship at Rensselaer Polytechnic for his master's work and um, he's also a reactor operator. Um, he's an author of the first Department of Energy handbook on uh, decommissioning so he's an expert witness nationally and internationally on decommissioning uh, nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. And I saw him on YouTube many, many times <laughs> <laughs> after Fukushima. And so I'm very delighted to meet you and hear you. So thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for, for coming and uh, happy Thanksgiving. Um, yeah, I, I have to Give credit to Maggie because uh, uh, for putting up with me, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but the the brains that you know, Fairwinds Energy Education, um, which is the which is the nonprofit that uh, that, that she founded, um, the media strategy is is hers. You know, the, the, the tweeting and Facebooks and the and, and the, the web strategy and and the, and the fundraising strategies and all that stuff are hers. I'm just the uh, the, the talking head. You know, I, I do the the, uh, the, the, the technical material, but <clears throat> as far as uh, making that material readily available, which I think is what we're perhaps uh, you know famous for, is uh, is, is Maggie's strategy. So, okay. so anyway, uh, yeah. It, if you're taking notes, it's Gunderson with an E, and it's Fairwinds with an E in the middle. That's uh, um, then it's has nothing to do with energy or anything. It was. Uh, Maggie's grandparents' blueberry farm is called Fairwinds, so <clears throat> we've decided to, to keep that name. Um, and um, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is, um, is, is how the, um, there's that book, uh, um, Don't Think of an Elephant, and of course the first thing you think of is, mm -hmm. is how the, the argument has been framed by the, the nuclear industry and the words that they, uh, uh, they'll use. Then I, they still slip, slip into my jargon. Uh, um, I, I was a senior vice president in the nuclear industry in, in 1990, um, found violations at the company I worked for, and was fired, and the um, Nuclear Regulatory Commission knowingly and deliberately botched the inspection. Um, John Glenn, Senator John Glenn, fired up inspectors general, and, and uh, um, they, they basically came to my rescue and, and found out everything I had spoken about was in fact true, congressional hearings and things like that. But um, the, the, the jargon of this industry 
um, makes terrible things appear pretty pretty routine. The the one example is accident, and I'm sure sometime today I will say in the Fukushima day, the accident. You know, an accident is when you're driving down the road and a, 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 an owl flies in front of you and breaks your window and you drive off into the ditch. You know, that's something that's totally um, uh, un, uh, unanticipated. The uh, Diet Commission, the Diet is the Japanese uh, parliament, the, the Diet Commission uh, looked at this uh, accident and they said, no, you can't use the word accident. This was um, in what could have been anticipated and in fact was anticipated by many uh, engineers and scientists over the years. Um, and so it's really, it's a man-made disaster, but it's really not uh, an, an accident. Um, an example of this is the, uh, the, the tsunami. In, in the, just in the last hundred years, Japan's had seven or eight tsunamis, um, the, the worst of which was 40 meters, 120 feet. Um, that's quite a wave. Um, and uh, in, in fact, uh, all of them were over 13 meter um, tsunamis. That's just in the last hundred years. If you go into the hills above the Daiichi site, there are markers that look like gravestones. And they're from around 700 AD. And it says, honor your ancestors. Don't build below this point. So the, the warnings were there for, for everybody to, uh, to understand. Um, and yet, you know, in, in our hubris as, as engineers, you look at this robust building and it's so impressive that um, you think it can withstand anything. So against that background, uh, Tokyo Electric uh, and General Electric down in San Jose, when I was a, a young engineer, I spent months at uh, General Electric down in San Jose, and Evasco Services, which was an engineering firm in Manhattan, decided that they could build a four meter tsunami wall. So a, a 12 foot high wall against a history of 120 foot tsunamis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it really, in the nuclear industry, there's this term, uh, MCA, max, M, yeah, maximum credible accident. And um, it's really not the, the accident that is the most credible, <clears throat> but it boils down to money. It's what you can um, afford to build and still stay competitive with alternatives like now wind and, and solar, but back then oil and, 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 uh, and coal. So, uh, uh, the, uh, what drives the, quote, maximum credible accident at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is if we build it any stronger, it will get too expensive. Uh, and you'll see that uh, being woven through a lot of the arguments that I'll, I'll make today. So there's four themes that, um, that I want to talk about. The, uh, the first one is that nuclear disasters are happening quite frequently. The, the second one is that not only are they happening frequently, but the intensity of the disaster is becoming worse. You would think that you know after a while you'd figure things out and they'd become less intense. Um, and the third one is the Fukushima Daiichi was really bad, but it could have been um, the destruction of Japan and uh, ramifications in the northern hemisphere that I really wouldn't want to even um, contemplate. And then the last one is that in, in California, you'll know that more than anybody, is that radiation knows no borders. So the first one is, um, is nuclear uh, disasters over my career. So this is, this is me. Did you click at? There we go. Sorry. You know that guy? <laughs> <laughs> that was when I got out of college and I'm not wearing a rug. It may, it may look like it, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> and so from the, that was 72, and the power plant is a general, general electric plant that was proposed but never built in upstate uh, Massachusetts. And uh, I'd like to think that that guy was uh, uh, quite smart, but not very wise. And I think that perhaps I've lost some neurons, but I, I think I might have become <laughs> wiser over, over time. So in my career, in the, the time span between that picture and and now there's been uh, uh, five meltdowns. The, the first one 
is um, the cerebral island. You know, and now kids know, kids talk about TMI, it's too much information. But to me, it's, you know, it, it's always meant through my island, yeah. I want to mention a good friend of ours, Danny Sheehan, was the uh, counsel for Karen Silkwood, and he's, he, I'll tell you some more about him later, but, but uh, he's a real good guy that <laughs> was on the good side. Oh, was he, was, was he on the TMI accident? Uh, he, he, well, he was, he represented her in the, in the lawsuit. Ah, okay. Because I, I was uh, called in um, after I, when I became a nuclear whistleblower, the a prominent attorney in the nuclear industry said, Arnie, in this business you're either for us or against us, and you just crossed the line. Um, so in 1994, I began to work for the, the plaintiffs in the Three Mile Island case. So you know, perhaps our, our paths crossed mm -hmm. back in 94. Anyway, so we had, uh, we had a, a meltdown at, at TMI. Then we had a meltdown at Chernobyl. And then we had a meltdown at Daiichi 1, and then Daiichi 2, and then Daiichi 3. So in 35 years, we've had five meltdowns. So if you do the math, there's one more slide there. If you do the math, um, you know, 35 divided by 5 is about once every seven years there's some sort of a nuclear meltdown. So essentially once a decade. The study just came out of Europe and they said uh, uh, that the Europeans have a 50-50 chance of having a meltdown in Europe in the next 10 years. And a little less than half the nuclear plants are located in Europe. So about once a decade we can expect to have a, a meltdown somewhere on the planet. But policymakers are told at the NRC that they'll tell you the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, they'll tell you that the chance of a meltdown is about one in a million per reactor year. So if you have 400 reactors, there's roughly 400 reactors in the, in the world, a million divided by 400 is, is a meltdown every 2,500 years. So our politicians in Washington and, and the, the people that are uh, our policymakers <coughs> are going on the basis of the, this estimate of uh, one, one million uh, years between meltdowns per reactor year, or a meltdown every 2,500 2, years. But in fact, history is telling us that we're having a meltdown every less than every decade. So that, that's lesson number one is that what policymaker would license Diablo Canyon if they knew the chance of a meltdown was going to happen in 10 years? But <clears throat> it's always uh, way out there because the, the the numbers that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uses through this thing called probabilistic risk assessment um, are, uh, are, are, are I, I'm trying to debate whether I say understated or overstated. The, uh, the consequences are understated and the, uh, the probability is, uh, is, uh, is understated. understated as well, yeah. Okay, so that's the point number one is we're gonna... Question? Yes? What do you know about Rocky Flats? Oh, Rocky Flats, there's, there are many, this is just nuclear reactor accidents, you know, the um, disasters, yeah, I said it, that's what, but Rocky Flats and, and there's been, if we look at the um, uh, front end of the nuclear cycle for the mining, um, the, the, the worst mining disaster was at, uh, at Church Rock, and happened three months after TMI, and likely was um, the, the most radiation released into the environment at any one time in the United States. Mm. But it happened on a Navajo reservation. And you know, indigenous people, and it's hard for the trucks to get there, and it was totally ignored by the, by the media. Um, mm. the, the, That's uh, Rocky Flats or something else? No, this is Church Rock. Church Rock. Yeah. Now Rocky Flats was a, a weapons facility along with Hanford. And we have this legacy of, of weapons waste sitting out there. Um, and uh, Hanford now is a 70-year cleanup and $110 billion to clean up the bomb waste we generated before essentially 1955. You now we just put this waste in the tanks and, and now we're saying, oh my God, it's heading toward the Columbia River. What are we gonna do? So we have these legacy sites. Rocky Flats is one, Hanford is one. Uh, we have the WIP Waste Isolation Project. That was the one that uh, 
had an explosion two years ago. It's a salt mine in uh, uh, New Mexico. Um, what do you have on the East Coast? Um, do we ship it west? No, no we, <laughs> so, have, you know, we have Savannah, Georgia. We have Savannah, Georgia, uh -huh. have Savannah, Georgia yeah. as well. And, and uh -huh. we actually had a, a site, the Apollo site in Pennsylvania, which also had uh, uh, statistically meaningful cancer clusters with out of court settlements with the nuclear industry. When the nuclear industry, when it appears like you're going to lose in the nuclear industry, they settle, and as part of the settlement, everybody signs non disclosures. Uh, but, but, uh, but the Apollo side is another example. Yeah. Let's get, so we have, I, I'm just talking about the nuclear reactor accidents, but there are many on the front end. Um, you know, Church, Church Rock is one, and there's Navajo uh, uh, mines throughout the, the predominantly the West. And on the, on the back end, we've got the WIP and, and potentially problems at Hanford. And the, the, um, the what about Los Alamos? I mean, some of the residents there say that they feel they're being radiated on a regular basis. Why don't, why don't yeah. we come to all this when you do the Q&A? Because yeah. there's a certain pattern, you know, and then the, we can open it all the way up. Um, then my, the focus of this is the middle, you know, the, the front end of the, the mining and the, uh, uh, the fabrication of the nuclear fuel is uh, uh, another, you know, when you think of the nuclear and it says clean, safe, reliable, well the front end of that cycle is not clean as, as mostly Native Americans would know. And the back end is the nuclear waste and uh, we certainly don't have a, a clue how to handle that. But, but I'm focusing on those five, th those 40 years when America has had 100 plus nuclear reactors and the world's had 400 nuclear reactors. I'm hearing she wants to move you on, so yeah. it'll be just one statement. I just wanted to let you know I helped shut down Rocky Flats, uh -huh. and it was based on the fact that we had people in front of us who were dying or whose mm -hmm. spouses had died, or whatever. From, mm -hmm. from we know a lot of the experts and attorneys who worked on that, and we advised mm -hmm. behind the scenes on some of that. So I was part yeah. of Physicians for Social Responsibility, oh, cool. and we did a guerrilla theater yeah. on site. And you know, Rocky, uh, we probably, the Rocky Flats is closed down, but it's still contaminated. Mm -hmm. and we're still finding it in the in the environs. And now the Department of Energy has just given it to the Park Services. So, yeah. Okay, so so number one is yeah, we'll that come the, back. We'll come back to the, yeah the chance of a nuclear disaster from a power plant is around once a decade. And if you knew that, you wouldn't be building a new alone allowing. Diablo to run for an extra 20 years. Okay, so the second point then is the the severity of these disasters is getting is getting worse. The the first slide there is that this is the uh, the core at uh, Three Mile Island after the meltdown. Um, I, I know the guys who ran this camera and they, they took this picture about 18 months after the nuclear accident disaster. Uh, what they did was they, um, the, the nuclear reactor has a big lid on it, like a pressure cooker, and they, um, they drilled a hole in the top of the pressure cooker and they put a camera down. And the, um, the person in charge of the crew uh, put the camera down to the right, um, right length and didn't see the nuclear core. And he said, something must be wrong with my measurements, so they pulled the camera back up and remeasured, and everything was fine. So they put the camera down a second time and they got down to the right length and they couldn't find the nuclear core. And he said, well, there's something wrong with our measurements. And they pulled it up and thought it through again. And then they put it down the third time and they still didn't find the nuclear core. And it was then that the guy realized, oh my God, we had a meltdown. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All this radiation and, they, and the, the industry mindset was such that we get, these things can't melt down. So uh, I actually, there's actually other pictures at the bottom of this, which shows this um, slag heap, basically like lava as it hits the ocean, um, that, that uh, were taken after the fact. So this is the first one, it's called a partial meltdown. You can see there's still some tubes that, that, that are, are standing there. Um, sort of like being partially pregnant though. It's, you know, you release uh, all of the noble gases and things like that. So. Okay, so the second one is, is Chernobyl. Oh, I should do this too. This is Steve Wing. Um, and this is the, uh, uh, 
the Susquehanna River and the River Valley. And what Steve, Steve's an epidemiologist at, uh, at UNC. And what he did was he got lung cancer data by county and plotted it. And what he discovered is that the lung cancers along the Susquehanna River are much higher than the lung cancers on either side up in the hills. And why is that? He said, on the day of the nuclear disaster at TMI, <coughs> TMI, there was an inversion. And the air sat in the valley so that the, um, uh, the contamination didn't run up the hillsides. Um, now, Wing shows that the cancer rates in the valley are double what they should have been. But if you go to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission webpage, they say nobody died at TMI. So, okay, so that was, uh, that's TMI. Second slide, uh, so this is the elephant's foot. And it's, the, uh, it's a picture taken by a robot at Chernobyl. And the, the nuclear core at, at Chernobyl became essentially lava, melted its way through into the basement of the building. Um, and this is it. If that core were sitting here, we'd, we'd be dead in around 10 seconds. It's that radioactive even today. So, um, called the elephant's foot. Um, this is why nobody has any clue how to, how to clean that up yet. And the, uh, the Ukrainians and, and the Russians and essentially the Europeans they as well. Enclose it and steal They're enclosing it now, yes. They enclosed it with something called the sarcophagus uh, in the couple of years after the accident. But um, they didn't make the foundation strong enough and it started to crack. So now they're, they, they've got another structure that's going over top of the sarcophagus. And um, they believe they, they can isolate that for at least 100 years with this, with this structure. But the stuff inside stays radioactive for thousands of years. So um, that's still a problem. However, a lot of the radiation will have decayed. Yeah. And it's something that um, countries around the world are contributing the funds to do this because um, Russia doesn't have enough money to do it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The and EU Ukraine has is, contributed something yeah. like $5 billion to the cover over over the Chernobyl. Mm. Um, uh, you say the cover over, but what about getting underneath it? The, there's, they're not doing anything with that. Yeah. I mean, because a lot of heat would be generated in that. Yeah. It? Well, this is now, what, what happens, uh, let me get to a slide about, I don't know, a couple dozen slides out here, um, and we'll, we'll talk about the heat issue. Uh, but you're right, th th this is still warm, but not molten hot. Okay, so Chernobyl, of course, we know contaminated large swaths of, of Europe as well. The, the, the saddest story to me is up in Lapland, which is up in the north end of, of Finland. Um, the indigenous cultures up there, the Laps, um, had to uh, import the reindeer so they could eat reindeer because the lichen in the soil that the natural reindeer uh, had uh, normally ate were so radioactive, if they killed the reindeer, they would be taken in um, you know, cancerous doses of, of, of radiation. So we were importing reindeer into Lapland to keep that indigenous culture viable. Uh, even today, um, in Wales, um, uh, you can't eat the cattle. And in Germany, um, uh, they in have Wales? stations in Wales? in Wales. And is that from Chernobyl rather than Yes, this is Chernobyl. Chernobyl nuclear. So this changed then. This map is uh, out of date because it Wales. Yeah, it doesn't. There's hot spots in the mountains of Wales as well that, that don't show, show on that degree. Okay. And in Germany, um, you know, we come from Vermont, and I, you know, in, in deer season, when you shoot a deer, you have to check out and go by a deer stand, and, and, the, and the, the state keeps records of how many deer were killed. Well, in Germany, when you kill a wild boar, you have to take it to a special station, and one third of the wild boar in Germany are too radioactive to eat, and they take them back. Yeah, and that doesn't show. Them. That doesn't show on there either. You know, so this uh, and wild boar, of course, eat a lot of the vegetation in the first inch or two of soil, which is where the radioactivity concentrates. So that's that's uh, Chernobyl. So, yeah. How did it get up all by on wind? Oh, isn't it? It's amazing how the, the wind pattern from, from the reactor was actually to the north and west initially. And the first indication the west had of a, of a problem 
was a plant in Sweden, a nuclear plant in Sweden. The workers coming to work in the morning when they went through the radiation portal were radioactive going into the plant. So they were picking up radiation from their cars as they walked in. And that's what alerted uh, authorities. Um, Alexei Yablikov, who's a friend of mine, has uh, really good data that shows that upwards of a, a million people will die from cancers from this. And uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency will say 40 are going to die. So there's a huge difference in the, in the data. Were it not for Voice of America, um, this disaster would be even worse. They, in Voice of America, they announced into the Soviet Union that there's been a meltdown and advised people to take iodine. And that prevented a lot of additional cancers. So, uh, you know, hats off to uh, the Voice of America for uh, doing something the Russians should have done and, and didn't. The next one is, um, is uh, Fukushima Daiichi. And I don't have a picture of the cork. And the reason is nobody has taken one yet. It's so radioactive that as they run these robots in, they're physically uh, destroying the electronics in these robots. Mm -hmm. Radiation yeah. levels are so high that they can't get a robot up against the core yet to take a picture. Mm -hmm. So we've got three nuclear cores. We know where they're not. They're not in the nuclear reactor, but we don't know where they are. Okay. You Oh, you, you presumably knew John Goffman. Say again? You presumably knew John Goffman. Yes. Yeah. But, and actually, uh, when, when John died, his, uh, uh, the estate sent us a lot of John's records. Um, and he's a, he's a wonderful scientist who saw this early on. You know. so, um, the, so the topic of the second point, the first point was that uh, accidents are going to happen on the order of every decade. Um, disasters are going to happen on the order of every decade. Uh, th the second one is that the magnitude of the disasters is actually increasing. So this is the Fukushima Daiichi site. Uh, Daiichi 1 is here, and it had already blown up. This is 2, 3, and 4. Um, so keep an eye on the middle one. Keep your eye on 3. Okay, this is the explosion. Um, which is, uh, there's two kinds of explosions. One's called a deflagration, which was what happened over here. And this is a detonation. And the difference is the speed at which the shock wave moves. Um, a, a deflagration shock wave travels at less than the speed of sound and is nowhere near as intense and, uh, and damaging as a detonation shock wave. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says this can't happen. So. Pay no attention to this because it, it can't happen. Uh, there's no containment in the world, Diablo or, or any containment in the world that can withstand a detonation shockwave. Um, so what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says, it's not an MCA. It's not, not a maximum credible accident. It's beyond that. Uh, but in fact, it happened. So we're going to shoot through this 20 slides in a row that show the devastation of that detonation shockwave. You can still see it here. That's pieces of roof falling down. And this all happened uh, after the earthquake? Well, this happened um, four days after the days tsunami. After tsunami. Tsunami, tsunami. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, I'll get into a little bit what caused uh, the actual uh, disaster. But uh, this is a nuclear containment blowing up. And because of the speed at which the, the, the shockwave hit the containment, it blew huge holes in the containment. Now, back in um, um, 2010, I was invited to speak to the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards. That's a, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has five commissioners and 4,000 staff members. And then they have an advisory group of 17 wise people. And they invited me to talk about, uh, I, I asked to talk about containment integrity. And I said, containments can fail. And I laid out 
39 situations in the United States where containments had sprung leaks. And they then went to the, the uh, staff, and the staff wrote back to them saying, no, uh, they assume there are no containment failures when you build in a, a nuclear reactor. So like if Diablo's accident analysis, and I keep using Diablo because it's the only plant left and left standing in, in, in California, but Diablo's accident analysis assumes 1% of the containment volume leaks the first day and a tenth of a percent after that. Um, so this, one more slide, is the uh, looking down, this is an infrared picture, looking down on uh, Daiichi Unit 3. This big red spot is the nuclear fuel pool, which was boiling and uh, mixing with air. And you'll see that the temperature in the fuel pool was 62 degrees centigrade, which is like 130 degrees. That's not the temperature of the water, but it was boiling water mixing with cold air to get to 62 degrees. Um, <coughs> that the fuel pool is boiling is a major concern, but the real concern is that right there. And if you follow that, that's 128 degrees C. If you remember your high school chemistry or physics, water boils at 100 C. So that's not steam escaping the nuclear reactor. That's hot radioactive gases. And this, hat, this picture was taken five weeks after the nuclear accident. Yeah? I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to uh, analyzing this from a point of view of a terrorist attack. If 10 people off of flatbed trucks shot missiles into 10 plants, what would happen? Um, this. Ten Unfortunately, times. yeah. You know, this and this type of reactor is the most vulnerable to a terrorist attack. Uh, Maggie and I were walking in February of 2011, and the Daiichi accident occurred in March. And, and Maggie said to me, where is the next accident going to be? We had been working on expert reports, and it gets pretty depressing. So we're, we're walking through our neighborhood in February, in, in cold February in, in Vermont, and she said, where is the next accident going to happen? And I said, I don't know, but I know it's going to happen at a Mark I reactor. And that's the, the GE design, and that's what this was. But the GE design has the fuel pool, which is this, eight stories high on the outside of the building. <coughs> and so the, the wall of the pool is a terrorist target. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, yet we have uh, 23 of this design still operating in the United States. And the, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission They're all is, publicly known. Yes. Right. Yes. So, What's to keep someone from that? What protection is in There's, place? There Can are you repeat the questions? Because yeah. it won't pick up on you. Ah. When you hear a question, just repeat it. Oh, okay. The, the, yeah, the question was uh, um, the, the vulnerability of any design, let alone this design, to a terrorist attack. With these, these fuel pools in, in, in Japan, they were pretty careful to get the fuel out of the fuel pool within seven or eight years so that there was not a lot of fuel in the pool. In, the Ameri in America, they put 39 years worth of nuclear fuel in the pool. So in these 23 power plants that are, are of the same design, each power plant has the equivalent of 700 nuclear bombs worth of, worth, worth of cesium in it. So you know, our point has always been, Maggie and I and, and Dave Lockman at Union Concerned Scientists, and and uh, Gordon Thompson at, uh, at Clark. We were just talking about Clark at dinner. And, and others, there's a group of scientists that say, get the fuel out of that fuel pool and down on the ground and dry cast. Now, at that point, it's still vulnerable. The Europeans use something called Haas, hardened on-site storage. So they take it out and they put it in a hardened building. And in America, we don't do that. We just stick it out and it looks like a forest of these large cylinders that are still a terrorist target. But this is, um, this is ground zero for a terrorist target. There's 23, including one that's 45 miles from Chicago. Are they doing something about this? No. Well, no, they actually, the, the staff at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission wanted to do something. And they were overridden by the five politically appointed commissioners a month ago. Oh my yeah. What's, what's the yeah. analysis wow. then? Uh, if a certain amount of these were hit on the airborne contamination of the populace in the U.S. No. 
Yeah, it's... You it, don't... You don't that you're, you're releasing the equivalent of 700 bombs worth of cesium. It would not be a good day it's for hard, anybody. It's hard to analyze. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Brookhaven National Labs did a study on that in the in the 60s and determined it would um, uh, um, yeah, they were looking at a, a plant that could have gone up on in uh, Long Island and they showed that a large part of Long Island would be uninhabitable so it's that you know that's that was a 1960s study that people have known about okay next slide um, now this is a, a scanning electron microscope picture of a uh, of a speck that came from someone's vacuum cleaner bag, and uh, that when when Marco Kaltofen at Worcester Poly got this, it was uh, uh, the the radiation detectors indicated there was something in the bag, and they isolated it down to these and a couple of other uh, specks. Uh, that's a, those are radioactive specks called hot particles, but they are pieces of nuclear fuel that were blown from the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. Nagoya, where the sample was, is 300 miles away. Wow. 300 miles away. So, and of course, in the Japanese culture, I'll, not everyone anymore, but a lot of them still sleep on the floor where the dust is. Um, and so, uh, it's not only in their vacuum cleaner bags, it's in their lungs. And we have other vacuum cleaner bags that we've asked for that uh, show that as well. Okay. These are car air filters. And uh, Maggie and I put out a request for car air filters that were shipped to uh, uh, Kaltofen's lab. And uh, these are called auto radiographs. When the car air filter came in, you lay the filter on a x-ray film. And you stick the x-ray film in a, uh, a dark space, a, a safe. And the, um, uh, to take it out seven days later. And each one of these is a burn mark in the x-ray plate from the radiation that was in the car filter. So this is a car in Fukushima City, 40 miles away, a car in Tokyo. And if you look carefully, there is actually, not at this resolution, but there was actually hot particle, there's one hot particle in that car filter in Seattle as well. So that... Um, if they lodge in the air filters, they lodge in people's lungs, which confirms what Wing said about the lung cancers that will happen. Uh, based on what we know happened at TMI, uh, it's pretty clear that we'll have significant lung cancers in, in Japan as well. Um, and now Kaltofen is uh, uh, trying to get a grant for um, scanning electron microscope time and uh, to analyze each one of these and find out exactly what the isotopes are. Um, but um, I was in Tokyo, and I, uh, Maggie and I wrote a book that was, uh, it's, it's in Japanese, it's not in, uh, in American, but... Um, in English. In English, yeah. <laughs> I, I was in Tokyo and, uh, for a book tour, and I took, I, have, I took five samples, one a day. I would walk down the street, and I'd just peel up a piece of the, uh, of the dirt that was stuck in the, in the pavement. I was right across the street from their, uh, uh, their, their Supreme Court. I took a piece of dirt from the, the pavement. It was up on our publisher's roof. He had a, they had a uh, garden up there, I took a piece. And every single, I only took a spoonful, um, every single sample I took would qualify as radioactive waste in the United States and would have had to have been shipped to Texas. And these people are living with it 24-7, 365. Yeah. And this year's, because I'm going to Japan in 2017. Yeah. Should I not go now? You know, what? yeah, my, I'm going, I'm going next, I'm going in February and March. My daughter's um, going yeah. tomorrow. You can't answer those questions. Oh, okay. Look, I have to tell you, legally, we are um, engineering experts and um, disaster, we do disaster analysis. We are not lawyers and we are not doctors. We are legally prohibited from telling you whether it's safe. From giving your, your medical well, advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we and can't. We, Tokyo we, too we can't to answer. Yeah. yeah, we can't answer. We can put the information out there, but we can't make yeah. that assessment. And if we do, we will be sued out of business. 
Right. So, so we have to be careful. Been yeah. down yeah. That route. So, <laughs> so you, you can you can talk to me afterwards, and I can I can tell you something that you, yeah. you can. I, I, I can tell you something. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's worked with some of the people doing the detection. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess I should ask: Is would you go there? <laughs> I'm going. I'm going okay, for three how weeks. Okay, I'm sixty. Oh. Okay. The, I'm he's, sixty-seven. He's six, no. Yeah, he's he's sixty-seven when he's there, and the chances are of anything that would happen to him, something else would happen before the cancer would form. Yeah, so if you were twenty-five or thirty, then you should. Maybe want to consider that differently. What does that mean? Oh, I see. So yeah, for, it's like for this kind of given big games to young people come to fruition, years and years and years. Yeah. You know, I, I usually um, I dedicate my speeches when I'm in to Japan to the the brave 200 people that that fought the fires of hell and brought this planet under, under uh, control, um, sort of control. Um, but <clears throat> there was a group of retired Tokyo Electric engineers and, and, and people who offered to go in to, to replace the young men. Because, you know, my cells aren't dividing anywhere near as fast as young men and I don't have any plans for children or things like that. So um, the older you are, the, the more likely something else will get you. Uh, so, okay, so next slide is the saddest one of them all. Um, we put word out, we asked for children's sneakers. And um, they, they came to the lab, the Kaltofen's lab. And these sneakers are the United States. And it doesn't mean that they're radioactive. That's the lower limit of detection. Um, and uh, we had seven uh, moms send sneakers from, uh, from Japan. And every single one of them was loaded with cesium. Oh, and what do kids do? You know, they tie their shoes. The hands go in the mouth. And, and it, it, to me, this says, more than than anyone. Yeah. So someone just asked, what, where, you know, where were these specific um, samples taken from? There, Marco's report is on our website. The whole report, it's an involved report, and so he you could go on there, Germans.org, and, and look at. Yeah. You know, he knows where they are, and I, don't, I off the top of my head, I don't know where they. But if we found a piece of nuclear fuel 300 miles away. I think it's pretty safe to assume we we find this anywhere. Okay, next slide. So the bottom line is that the severity of, of disasters is not decreasing. It's in fact getting worse. So once a decade we're having a disaster that's worse than the one before. Um, Chernobyl was one nuclear core that melted and Fukushima was three. So the gases, the, the xenon and the krypton, we call them noble gases, were three times more noble gases released from, um, uh, from Fukushima than from Chernobyl. Concentration of those noble gases over Seattle was 400,000 times, 400,000 times, that's 40 million percent higher than normal. To give you an idea, during the during the peak at the end of March and into April, and and that's um, uh, one of the universities in Texas. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. Um, held the study up to get the peer review, but you know they knew in in March that uh, Seattle was getting blasted by noble gases. The study came out a year later because it went through the peer review process, which is uh, sad. In, yeah. And is there any other information about the distribution of that cloud of radioactivity? In other words, it couldn't have just been satellites. No, we have found um, Kaltofen, uh, if you go up on our site, Kaltofen did a presentation to the uh, American Public Health Association, APHA. Um, and he talks about the sites that he had set up around the country. Um, but it, it, the, the worst of it was as far north as Vancouver, and as far south as Portland. So that the, the, the brunt of that, we did see a little bit in Northern California, even further north than where we are now. And, and, and um, there was a pier down in uh, San Diego that was the first to detect the radiation uh, back uh, like four days after the accident, so the disaster. So the, um, uh, but the predominant brunt of it was uh, on, the, um, on the weather side of the Cascades. Yeah. And, and then there was fallout. 
because as the weather patterns move, there is fallout and it just comes down. There was fallout uh, in Idaho. There was fallout in, was it Arkansas? Yeah. Or Alabama? Yeah, Florida. Arkansas. And Definitely. Florida. They, and, they, mm -hmm. and it matched. They can tell what signature the radiation matches, yeah. that it was definitely um, Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. How do we know this came from Fukushima as opposed to just bombs or whatever? Uh, there's two kinds of cesium, cesium 134 and 137. 137 has a 30-year half-life, and 134 has a two-year half-life. So that um, if you see both of them, you know it's current. Um, and within 10 years, we won't be able to differentiate anymore from what was left from the bomb versus, versus what came from uh, the, this, this disaster. So we've gone from a partial meltdown of one reactor to a complete meltdown of one reactor to a triple meltdown in, in my career. Yeah? Um, is the fallout in rain, or when you say fallout, is that like wind, rain? Um, yes, both. both. Um, uh, Kaltofen had... Um, um, an air filter set up in Seattle, a couple of them set up in Seattle, and uh, the air filter was designed to pull 10 meters, cubic meters a day of air through it, which is what you and I breathe. Your, your, your total tidal capacity of your lungs is around 10 cubic meters. And then he analyzed each of those samples, and uh, you know, some was on rainy days, Seattle, but some of them was not. And over that month, the average person in Seattle ingested about 10 hot particles a day. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Are the noble gases something we should worry about? Or are they just They're gone now. You know, and <coughs> just came out of the reactor. I have a, Amazing. if you go up on so the Fairland site. Say the statement what again. What does that mean? What, what, is that? Is that? what oh. are noble gases? No, the first off, they totally disperse. They all have relatively short half-lives. But they are radioactive. They're incredibly radioactive, oh. yeah. Um, if you go up on the Fairland site, um, I spoke at the, um, uh, Helen Caldicott had a, uh, a New York Academy of at the Medicine. New York Academy of Medicine on the second anniversary, so it was March of 2013, and I spoke and I talked an awful lot about those noble gases, and the, uh, the health physics establishment, the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, is not looking at that, but the exposure of people in Japan was extraordinarily high but nobody was measuring it. Um, so nobody's calculating it right now. Yeah. 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 Um, um, the impression I get from my reading is also that there's a whole background of these very aging nuclear plants, which they're finding all sorts of things wrong and repairing them often just in time. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of on the edge where the actual risk factor is much higher Yes. than you'd think, because they're only just managing to contain Yes, it. that's a great point. The, you know, the, these uh, uh, disaster frequency numbers are based on, Three Mile Island was three months old when it blew. Uh, Chernobyl was five or six years old. Um, and now the average nuclear reactor in the world is now 30 years old. Um, so they're at a point where uh, they're well beyond the middle of their design life, and uh, they're more prone to break. So you're, you know, um, Diablo, although it was licensed in 85, the construction actually started in 67. Oh. And then they built it backward. Uh, the, the, the prints were, were reversed. And so it wound up taking them 17 years to build. Uh, but you're looking at a 60s design that's run for 30 years, and here's Pacific Gas and Electric wanting to extend that until um, 2050. That's the GE um, design? No, Diablo is a Westinghouse design. So Diablo is not the, uh, the Fukushima design. Okay, so this is the so second point is that the frequency, uh, first point was frequency is pretty darn high. Second is that consequences are getting worse. So the third point then is that as bad as Daiichi was, it could have been a lot worse. Um, and the key, you know, we all know that when a uranium atom gets hit, it splits and creates a lot of energy. And if that's all that happened, we wouldn't be here today. But what, what really happens is that these two pieces that come off, the radioactive rubble that left behind, they're called fission products, are themselves physically hot. And they stay hot for five to 10 years, and they stay radioactively hot for hundreds if not thousands of years. But the physical heat of a nuclear reactor, 93% of it happens right here, but 7% happens here. 
7% sounds like peanuts, but the Daiichi reactor, each Daiichi reactor was generating 4 million horsepower. So when it shuts down, the, the, the control rods go in and the chain reaction stops, 97, 93% of that power goes away, but 7% of 4 million is still a quarter of a million horsepower of heat that has to be gotten rid of. And um, that heat is in the nuclear core is about 12 feet by 12 feet by 12 feet. So think of a quarter of a million horses trapped in something 12 by 12 by 12, and you can get a feel for the amount of heat that still has to be um, liberated. So when you hear a nuclear reactor, quote, safely shuts down, what that means is the chain reaction stops. But they still have to get rid of the heat from this radioactive rubble. OK, next slide. So what happened at Daiichi, you know, we all hear that this, the tsunami came, and it flooded the diesels, and there was no electricity. Right? That's the standard the party line. That happened. But even if the diesels had been 300 feet high, this disaster still would have happened, and here's why. This is a satellite view looking down at the water. And these are the cooling pumps along the water that provide the cooling for the diesels. It's like the water pump on your car. What happens when the water pump on your car breaks your engine overheats? So if the diesels had started at Daiichi, they would have run for two minutes, and they would have overheated because the tsunami had wiped out the pumps along the coast. So this, we call this a Lewis, a loss of the ultimate heat sink. The key is ultimate. You, know, you need to dump that water into the, into the ocean, and they couldn't. So even if the diesels had, been, uh, had survived, um, Daiichi still would have had three meltdowns. So the next thing that gets into this issue of luck even more. When the, uh, when the earthquake hit, uh, Anagawa had three nuclear reactors, Daiichi had six, Fukushima Daini had four, and Tokai had, had one. Uh, There's 14 nuclear reactors that were hit by the tsunami, and they had 37 diesels between them. 24 didn't work because their cooling systems were flooded. And you know, most of those were at Daiichi, but every single reactor site up and down the coast lost diesels, not because they were flooded by the tsunami, but because the pumps along the ocean were flooded. So what does that mean? And um, this is where luck comes into it. This earthquake had happened at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. Every one of those power plants had about 1,000 people on the day shift. If it had happened at 2 o'clock in the evening, in the middle of the night, every one of those reactors would have had 100 people. There was not, the management would have gone, the technical people were home, and you would have been left with a skeleton crew. The, um, the consequences of just that 12 hour shift, um, Daiichi's a big enough disaster as it was, but it would have destroyed Japan if it had happened 12 hours later. Uh, now we're dealing with a technology that, uh, well, let's go to our next slide. <coughs> so the conclusion is that it could have been worse. The first point is that every mechanical <coughs> system failed, every single one. The second point is that the, the timing of the accident, the disaster, the earthquake that provoked the disaster um, couldn't have been better. You know, it happened in the middle of the day when they had a full staff. If those um, people had gone home, they couldn't have gotten back to work because the infrastructure was destroyed. A lot of these guys were working um, not knowing whether their families were alive. Um, so the first point is uh, every piece of technology failed. The second point is luck. Um, related to that was that the winds were blown out to sea. About 80% of the radiation from the disaster went into the Pacific. And you know, now we're experiencing that in, in um, diluted form in California. But if the winds had blown the other way, like they do in certain seasons in Japan, it would have cut Japan in half. And you would have had a northern Japan and a southern Japan, and a band in the middle that was uninhabitable. And then the last piece is courage. Um, they talk about the Fukushima 50. In fact, there were less than 200. Uh, people on that site who stayed. A bunch, a bunch left. 
but they were totally dedicated to the one man, their, their plant manager, who has since died of, of cancer. Um, and Japan owes their existence as a country to the courage of 200 people. So this is a technology that can, uh, uh, when you have to rely on luck and courage, that's not something you really want to uh, bet, your, bet your boots on in the, in the future. Okay. So I, I got to know Naoto Khan. Uh, he was the um, prime minister of Japan during the uh, disaster. Um, and uh, his comment was, our existence as a sovereign nation was at stake. He almost had to evacuate Tokyo. 35 million people. Where do you send 35 million people? You know, go live with your relatives or something like that? <clears throat> so um, the other thing is that uh, Gorbachev, in his memoirs, says that the fall of the Soviet Union was not due to perestroika, but was due to Chernobyl. So we've got, in writing, in, in, in Gorbachev's uh, memoirs, he, he, he says that. So here's a, you know, a, a communist dictator and a elected, uh, an elected uh, official, both coming to the same conclusion that this is not a technology, uh, this is a technology that can ruin your country overnight. Um, I was talking to Khan, uh, he and I spoke together, uh, I think it was, well we, we did a tour here in California, but then we were uh, in New York City and I said to him, Mr. Prime Minister, um, I, want, uh, I want you to know that I think, that I think, is that okay? I can talk over it. Great, keep talking over it. Okay, uh, I said, that, <laughs> I think that um, uh, knowing what you knew, you made the right decisions. And Khan said to me, he thanked me, because he's under a lot of pressure at home. He should have evacuated sooner. Um, but he's not a nuclear engineer, and he had to rely on the people that reported to him. And he told me uh, eloquently, he said, the information I had was neither timely nor accurate. So not only was Tokyo Electric not telling them the truth, but Medi, the, the Ministry of, the, uh, of Industry, didn't tell him the truth. He was getting no useful information from anybody. I wish he had turned to the Fairman's website, but he did. But he did have me sign the book, which is kind of cool. So, you know, that when, when you rely on, that, it talks about how in bed the, the regulators and the, uh, um, and the industry are, that Khan got no useful information from anybody. Okay. Are they doing something about that? I'm sorry, say what? Are they, you know, <laughs> legislatively trying to do something no, about that? No, they'll tell you well, more, they, much worse than you think. Yeah, what the Japanese oh did, um, the regulator was part of the industry, uh, the, the Ministry of Medi, M-E-T-I, the, the, the industrial uh, uh, cabinet folks. They did move that out, uh, but the same people that were regulating it when it was in are now regulating it when it was out. Uh, initially, when it was set up under, under Naoto Khan, the appointed officials were all open-minded, but now we've got the uh, Abe administration systematically picking off the, uh, uh, the people running the organization and replacing them with pro-nuclear people. So that we're seeing Japan revert back to the old paradigm where the, the industry and the regulator are inextricably intertwined. Is that true here too, though? I'm sorry, I'm hearing it. It's not Isn't here. it true here, though? Can oh, <coughs> it, uh, yeah, yeah, it really is. You know, that I can count on three or four fingers the number of, of NRC commissioners who didn't go to work for the nuclear industry. Um, you've got one here in California, Victor Berlinski. We have one in Vermont, uh, Peter Bradford. Uh, Greg Yasko, uh, who was the former chairman, who got run out of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by pressure from industry. There's, there's only three or four that, uh, that had the courage to stand up. So yes it is, although in the world's view we are more separated than, uh, than almost every other regulator. So next slide. You know, when you look at, I, I should talk about this for a split second. When you, when, you, when you work in a power plant, they are so robust that there's this hubris that says, what could possibly go wrong? And the, the, 
but you never ask the question, why are they this robust? And the reason is that in a 12 by 12 by 12 cube, they've got four million horses running. And the minute one of them trips, you've got a real problem on your hands. So that the nuclear power plants uh, impress people by their robustness and impressed me you know, when I was in the nuclear industry. And the hubris of looking at this significant building, is such a, you, you ask yourself, what could possibly go wrong? And here's an example. Oh, what can go wrong? So my quote is, uh, sooner or later, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to end um, so the, on this issue of radiation having no borders. Um, now here's Naoto Khan and Gorbachev saying, my country was at stake. Um, you know, we're now beginning to experience uh, the Pacific being contaminated with, with some radiation, with more on the way, because Fukushima continues to bleed into the Pacific to the tune of 400 tons a day. That's, you know, the trucks on the side of the road that pour water on the, uh, on the dirt to keep it from, um, uh, when, there, when there's construction to keep the dust down? That's the equivalent of 25,000 of those trucks dumping into the, into the Pacific. It's a lot of water. Um, yeah? Do they have any plans to change that? And is there likely to be a world consortium to actually fix mm -hmm. that problem? Because that's huge over the long term. Yeah, the, the world consortium is uh, 15 of us wrote to Ban Ki-moon. And we suggested a, a world consortium to, uh, to tackle the problem. Um, and the Japanese government wants to keep TEPCO in charge, and the Japanese government doesn't want to take control, because when things go to hell, they've got nobody to blame at that point. So they, they can blame Tokyo Electric now, and it's a comfortable relationship for both, for both parties. Um, the real solution would be to have an international consortium, and the oversight of that consortium, uh, the, the, the 15 of us that wrote to Ban Ki-moon said that it, it should be a public oversight group um, and not reporting into Medi because you're going to have the same problems. Um, and that was, uh, uh, I'd like to say rejected, but it was just ignored. Um, so th there's also talk uh, that in the nuclear industry there's seven levels of, of disasters and level seven is a nuclear meltdown. Uh, then Maggie and I and a, a few other people have been lobbying for a level eight which is a multiple unit, because the multiple unit requires an international response that perhaps a single meltdown doesn't. And again, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, has not been, um, they, that's, that's a recommendation that's been ignored as well, um, about a level eight accident. So what's being done, um, you know, I, I decommissioned power plants. That, that, that was, I was senior VP in the group I ran uh, that, that's what we did. And I have no clue how to solve this problem. Um, you know, it's, there, there's, the, the magnitude of the radiation levels are such that we've never seen anything like this before as a, as a profession. Um, they've got to stop the ground order from going in, and that'll protect the Pacific. Uh, I had recommended uh, two months after the accident to build a zeolite wall. Uh, if, if here's the water and here's the plant, build a zeolite wall here because what's happened is uh, Tokyo, there was a huge cliff. It was a 120 uh, foot high cliff. And when they built the plant, they cut it down to 30 feet. And of course, all of that groundwater now moving out of that mountain range is running directly into that power plant. Um, so you've got to stop the groundwater from going in. Um, Tokyo Electric came up with this harebrained idea for an ice wall. They were going to build a, a three mile long wall of ice that would go down to bedrock and they would freeze it. it. It failed and had it succeeded their electric bill to cool it would have been 10 million dollars a month <laughs> you know, for, for God knows how long. Um, but they've got to stop the water from going in and I still think the zeolite trench is, is the part of the problem. Once you, if, here's the water, here's the plant, here's the zeolite trench, that would allow you to, to drill wells outside the zeolite trench and the radiation that's inside would try to migrate out because the water table would be dropping, but zeolite is an excellent material for absorbing uh, cesium. At West Valley, which is another one of these sites like, um, uh, another one of these legacy sites in America near Buffalo, they built a zeolite trench around it. It was very effective 
at preventing the migration. So we have good data that I see electrons should do that. Uh, when I brought that up to uh, Koichi Nakamura, who was a, a friend of mine in Japan, uh, his response was, Arnie, TEPCO doesn't have the money. Mm -hmm. And that part of the problem here is that uh, when you have a nuclear meltdown, you have to fight it like it's a war. And the first couple months are critical. You know, it's a, the, the horses are out of the barn now. Um, and um, TEPCO and the Japanese government uh, were pennywise and pound foolish. They never marshaled the, the, the uh, resources soon enough to, uh, to tackle the problem. So I wanted to finish on, on the economics of new nukes based on, based on this. Uh, and there's no slides, I'll, I'll just talk briefly. Um, I, I gave the one slide here, that new nuclear power will actually make global warming worse. Climate change will be worse if we commit to um, a large number of nuclear power plants. Um, and Maggie and I are working on a report about this that will be published in likely January. Um, the total amount of carbon dioxide thrown into the atmosphere now is, um, uh, this is from industrial uh, cars, heating, and electric power. The total number is 40,000 million tons a year of carbon dioxide. So 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide goes up into the atmosphere a year. If, and we have 400 nuclear plants quote, mitigating that. The, um, if those plants were not running and if we were using natural gas to replace them, um, we'd have 3% more natural, we would have 3% more CO2 going up. So that our present 400 nuclear plants aren't doing anything. When you hear about, oh, shutting down Diablo Canyon is going to cause the, uh, the ice cap to melt, it's, it's just not true. The nuclear contribution for total of these 400 plants is only 3% of what humankind has thrown up. So what we did was we said, well, let's say you wanted to make a 20% dent in the problem. Um, so let, let's, that would begin to bend the curve. And what would it take if you had 20, uh, you committed that nuclear power is gonna, gonna uh, eliminate 20% of the carbon dioxide that goes up into the atmosphere. Um, and it would take 3,000 nuclear power plants to do that over 20 years we could build them. And that's essentially one nuclear power plant every other day for 20 years would have to come online to just bend the curve 20%. The cost of that, uh, the, a nuke right now, uh, there's a, a two unit plant, plant being proposed in England for $32 billion. So about 16 billion per, per plant. And there's another single unit nuke in Virginia at $19 billion. There was two in Florida for 25 billion. So in excess of $10 billion a nuke, and if you've got 3,000 nukes times $10 billion, you're looking at $30 trillion, or more than the world's GNP, um, to, uh, to build nukes that only bend the curve by 20%. Um, you mean the actual output of the carbon dioxide building I, I'm going to get to that. That's the next point. Yeah. So that's just the cost, and, and that. So if the world commits thirty trillion dollars to building these these three thousand nukes, um, that's money that could be used elsewhere, like building wind farms and solar collectors. And economists call that the, the opportunity cost. You know, if you've committed to this approach, you can't do the, these approaches. Um, and um, the average nuclear plant, uh, according to Michael Schneider, is it takes in excess of 10 years to build. So, yeah. Who's Michael Schneider? Oh, Michael Schneider is a, a really famous Frenchman. Uh, if you know Amory Lovins uh, here at the Rocky Mountain Institute, Michael is Amory's counterpart in, in Europe. Um, and both of them did uh, interviews with us on the, on the website. If you type in the search function of Michael Schneider, you'll have that one. And, and Amory did one with me too. So this issue of opportunity cost is critical. Carbon dioxide is not going to take up a, a, a 20 year vacation. So while you're building these plants, the, the carbon dioxide is growing at about two, two ppm per year. So carbon dioxide will be 40 ppm higher before the nuclear plants can begin to, uh, to bend that curve. Whereas a wind farm can come online in a year. So the um, and the other piece of that is that the wind farm is 
a heck of a lot cheaper per kilowatt. Um, new wind is uh, about four cents a kilowatt. New nukes, the, the, the contract price for the plants in England converted to dollars is about 16 cents a kilowatt. So a new wind is a quarter of what new, uh, uh, new nukes go for. Um, new solar is about five cents a kilowatt. And, um, uh, but well, the, there's a comment, well, yeah, but this, the, the wind doesn't blow all the time. So what do we do in the interim? Um, Amory Lovins will say that, you know, when you build enough windmills, it's blowing somewhere so that effectively you don't even need batteries. And uh, um, Tesla uh, has just come out with something called the Powerwall. And uh, I was quoted in Forbes magazine as saying that uh, the nuclear industry would have you believe that if you, um, that we, humankind, is smart enough to store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years, but we, humankind, are so dumb we can't figure out how to store electricity overnight. And, and Tesla seems to have, have broken through. Uh, the numbers I'm hearing for the cost of storage um, five years out will be around two cents, maybe three. So if you take wind at four plus storage, at, even if it's five cents, you're, you're at nine cents for stored wind versus 16 cents for new nukes. Why are we doing this? So one of the reasons I was so excited to, to come tonight is this issue of you know, the center has a sustainability focus. And we've got the climate change talks that occur in Paris coming up. And uh, I, and I think what motivates me this year in its entirety with the Northwestern speech and, and, and next year is making sure that, thank you, is making sure that um, the global warming is real and we have to do the most cost effective way of bending the curve. And the, the nuclear power is not it. We don't have to even discuss the chance of, uh, of an accident, or we don't have to discuss the chance of, uh, of where we're going to put the waste. You can take all that off the table and look at money, and it doesn't make economic sense. So that's really the, the, the last point I'd like to leave you with. Is, uh, if you get a chance to talk to somebody about the things that will go on in Paris, uh, the, the opportunity cost that we're walking away from by ignoring uh, I, I wanted to, yeah. yeah. Doesn't the money issue actually fall on the corporations that are building the plants? The, that makes sense to them, not to the, to the survival of humanity. <laughs> so, yes. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the nuclear industry in America has um, spent $670 million in the last 10 years on lobbying. That's $70 million in direct campaign contrib contributions and $600 million on lobbyists. And, you know, if you're spending that kind of money to lobby Congress, you better be sure there's a real upside. And the upside is, you know, $30 trillion worth of, worth Isn't of work. Isn't the solution is who are the people's representatives in office? Aren't these the people who are making decisions? Aren't these the people who put forward the regulations? Aren't our agencies those people who follow the law, supposedly, just like toxic, toxic substances? The regulations are at a level, but below that, they're bioaccumulative. <laughs> yeah. Who, who's running the show here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think it, it shows the collapse of, of democracy as we know it, and let's hope we can change it. But uh, you're, you're absolutely right that right now the, the force of lobbying and the, the force of those campaign dollars, and, and it's both Democrats and Republicans. You know, uh, yeah. there there are no there there are Democrats and Republicans. You know, there there are no. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> a Democrat and a Republican is, uh, yeah. so there really is no distinction politically when you look at nuclear power. Yeah. Um, they're all uh, in the thrall of the nuclear industry. Yeah. yeah, so this this really turns into a massive in-your-face political issue on so many different levels within this crazy society. And we've got the best democracy that money can buy, yeah. essentially. Yes. And that has to change because otherwise Everything is going down the tubes. But yeah. Well, you, you all, you know, Maggie and I wanted to. I, I think I'm at a point now where Maggie and I wanted to answer questions together because um, I'm, I'm talked out. <laughs> <laughs> Let me answer. With, let's no, tell you, you take one it to an, I want you to go back to the gentleman in the back too, because talk about what happened in in Georgia with and in Florida, what's happening with the billing of building oh, new yokes? Yeah, because yeah, I yeah. think that's an important. Thing to understand. Uh, they, Please they, finish they this. Tell you best. Um, 
Bernie Sanders lives in Burlington, Vermont, and, and he used to live on our street. He's a nice guy. And so Bernie and his wife were walking down the street one day, and I walked up to him and I said, Bernie, I want to be the next commissioner at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And, and in his usual way, he just started to laugh, and he said, are you kidding? There's no way in hell they'd let you have that job. <laughs> and though it really does speak to the, the industry influence on the decision-making process. So what's happening now, there's five nuclear plants being built in America right now, and there's seven or eight that have shut down, so we're, we're still losing ground. The five are in states that have socialism. Uh, it's Georgia, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Um, the, um, I'm watching. Oh, socialism. Socialism. You know, the, 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 oh, risks, the risks of over, uh, over budget nuclear reactors are being borne by the people, and the benefits, the profits are accruing to the stockholders. So we socialize the risk. In Georgia, North Carolina, and Georgia, South Carolina, and, uh, uh, and the plants and are not c built yet. They're well, under construction, and every ratepayer has to pay for it now in their bill yes. for plants that not will be that will not come online for 20 years. Well, and they're already they're already four billion over budget, and they're already three years behind schedule. They've been building them for three years, and they're now three years behind schedule. And they're already four billion over, and the ratepayers are on the hook. Now the industry in Georgia and South Carolina cut a deal that they're not carrying those costs. The costs are being carried by the by the by the little people. So, um, and that speaks. To, I've testified in, in Florida in a similar hearing, uh, and um, there's an example in Florida. Florida has um, was proposing four new nuclear power plants. Uh, costing $48 billion for the four of them. And it would double the capital cost of all of the nuclear reactors in Florida, of all of the power plants in Florida, forget just the So the, it would double the capital cost of all the power plants in Florida, and it would increase the capacity of Florida by 8%. That's all, for all 8%. that money. Yeah. So what, <coughs> yeah, so that's, and, and yet the, the the Florida legislature passed the bills that are allowing these plants to be, the cost to be uh, accrued onto the ratepayers as they're being built. And the risks are carried by the ratepayers. And when they're done, you're stuck with $48 billion at 11% is what they're guaranteed oh, their rate of return. I mean, take my retirement plan, please. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, they're getting a guaranteed 11% rate of return on $48 billion. So it's, uh, it, the, the process is uh, uh, in, in, de in regulated markets like you know, Georgia, South Carolina, and TVA is the other one. The TVA reactor is going to go online in, um, uh, in January. And it started construction in 1972. Oh my God. When, when, I, when I got out of college, they put the shovel in the ground, and it's finally being built now. Um, and, the, and the cost is, um, the, I, I have, the, is a huge increase in the cost How, compared how do you to relate to it from the, these are crimes against humanity if you take the veil away. How do you relate to that and how do you get the message out? What you're doing is basically to me the foundation of the message. Mm -hmm. But the message needs to be delivered not just in entertainment, entertainment looks at it, but it needs to be delivered through the through young people to be the seed of the next positioning. Mm -hmm. And they need to know, they need to know that the representatives have sold their future. And how do you make that work? Where's the, where's the simplicity of what you can say that will generate to the positive end? We, we use social media, we use all the strategies that we can to reach that demographic. Um, and it's your work. You know, we have a nonprofit, and we, the nonprofit charter does not allow us to lobby. It's, uh, we're an educational group, and we're not allowed to lobby. We're not allowed to um, protest or endorse a you know, do any of these things. So, um, but what we do do is all of our material is open on the net. Anything you want to use and you want to share with family, friends, send out in letters, put on your fa Facebook page, put on a website, it, it's called a Creative Commons license, and it's share and share alike. You give us attribution for doing the work, and you can share it fully. Mm -hmm. And all of our technical reports that have been um, filed with the NRC or in federal court 
are all on our website so that people can access it. We're, we're putting that out there. And all the reports we write, um, and we've been criticized for this by uh, nuclear attorneys for the industry. They said, oh, uh, we don't use enough nuclear jargon that Arnie spoke about before. Nuke speak. We don't speak in nuke speak. Mm -hmm. I, every report that he writes technically, then we make sure is also in lay language that legislators, judges, people who aren't schooled in new speak can understand and that people can share around the country and around the world. We have about 11 million viewers who watch our work around the world. And that's not just from our website. We've tracked that. We had um, someone come in and they, they donated their time to help us track it by looking where the shares are going and finding the different websites from you know, Union of Concerned Scientists to Sierra Club to Greenpeace, all of those, to just, you know, so-and-so's... Miss um, Milky the Clown. <laughs> yeah, she, she shares Ms. a lot Ms. of our work. We don't even know who that Ms. is. It's a woman that has a website like that. But, um, you know, the Sunrise Center, um, there, there are holistic practitioners and um, centers all over the country that share our work and all over the world. And, and that's what we, we try and do. But at dinner, Lori was talking about it's a three-legged stool. You know, our, our, the leg that we can provide is, is technical data, but you need activists and you need a political component. And did I get that right? No. So, yes, and, you need uh, an educational group. You need a, uh, and usually under a nonprofit, you need a, a group of activists, and you actually do also need usually a. a official uh, as somebody who's in office or um, or a, a person running for office who mm -hmm. takes a stand on that issue. Yeah. <coughs> so and I don't know that any one group or certainly not us can do it all. You know, our, right. We view our job as that uh, we'll, we give good solid supportable technical stuff but um, and, and hopefully then other people can take pieces of that and move it forward. There are voices. <coughs> The Bay Area is a community, actually, that has a history of putting forward the voice. And the networks that are across country and on a global level now. Twenty years ago, we looked at Hamilton. They closed the base. But they, they covered a toxic waste site with a cover. They said the earthquake zone, there's a stream going to the Bay, and all the rest of it, and they left everything in there. And they methaned out in a multiple of, of, of tubes to a community that's about 30 feet to 100 feet away that they built. Mm -hmm. Now, the bottom line to that is those are, that's one, one little piece mm -hmm. in a closed military base. Now, we're talking about something mm -hmm. here that, that you're representing an issue that is a terrorist potential, that is, that is a, a, a life, health issue, that is a future in the, in the fact of any living thing on Earth from the human viewpoint. Mm -hmm. You've got something very solid. No group can go out there and talk to the issue without the content. And you are a foundation of that content. Now, I work with people, I represent and oversee about five nonprofits. And I know I can't step out of that line for the political reason. But if you go into questioning, if students come across the country, one of my board members is the former president of the National Association of College Admissions mm -hmm. Counselors. That's all the schools in the country, mm -hmm. plus international. We can bring students into what you have. That would really blow things over. In yeah. 10 years, those students will be what, like we were in the 1960s. Yeah. That the, the evolution of the technology came from the 1960s, the forward look. We're beginning to see uh, more universities interested in what we have to say. Uh, this year I spoke at Northwestern, um, and, and Forbes covered the story, and uh, 460 thousand people read the Forbes story, which is cool. But then we also spoke at Hofstra. The, the most interesting one to my way of thinking, we spoke at uh, Clarkson University in upstate New York. It's a, a really good engineering school. Um, and it was to an engineering ethics class. Um, and they set up the room. They said, you know, we'll have 40, 40 students here. We'll advertise. And they're, they're, you know, we'll have 200 seats. Um, and um, people started coming. And, they had to open up the wall and add another 200. They opened up the wall and added oh, another okay. 200. So we had 600 people uh, listening right. to, we told our story, uh, which we don't do very often, uh, which was speaking truth to power and, and how we 
lost everything and confronted the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, but I found it really heartening, you know, that, ah, that we, just, we just heard, you know, that 600 people would show up at 6 o'clock in the evening uh, to listen to, to two older people. Uh, I'm old. I won't speak for you. But, but you know, it, uh, was, it's incredibly heartening. Um, but uh, I don't think it's the norm yet. I have a, a question yes. about President Carter. Have, has President Carter addressed this in his writings? He, when he was president, he addressed it. He was, you know, he really understood the need to move to renewables. And we had the solar collectors on the White House, and Reagan took them off, and all, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so he was a visionary while in office, but I, I he really hasn't. Uh, uh, you know, he's taken up the human rights issues incredibly. Uh, in my opinion, Andalus. the greatest ex-president we ever had. Mm -hmm. um, but he really hasn't uh, continued that pursuit of, of uh, renewables and energy efficiency like he did while he was in office. Well, you might consider uh, writing him a letter, just a note, saying, you know, maybe before you check out, you want to address this one more time. Huh. He's yeah. still building houses with Habitat for Humanity. He might have enough juice left to to in his last book. Give us a position paper. You know, but the Pope uh, uh, did not uh, laud nuclear, which is exciting, you know, that, so that I think uh, some people are, although the Dalai Lama has actually suggested that nuclear would be a good thing. Um, so we're, uh, uh, you know, so he did, yeah. That's a, he might be advised differently. He might be advised differently, except for, yeah, I don't have a, <laughs> Contact. But, yeah, that, uh, yeah. Would you comment on last month Obama signed the nuclear life support system, almost uh, like a trillion dollars, some ridiculous amount of money that he just signed to take care of the nuclear industry, and boosting it up? Can you comment on that? No, I don't know. Um, there, there was. Why did you come in front of the camera, Dan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't leave me. <laughs> You're sitting down. <laughs> you can sit Thank down. You. You're tired. I drove a lot today. <laughs> um, there, that was not the full act. A lot of people stopped what he was trying to do in there, and, and some of what nuclear was to get was removed. But what happened 10 days ago was, or was it? maybe it was two weeks ago, it was a really big deal. Because on a Friday afternoon, which we always call that a news dump with the NRC, the president had a private meeting with all the nuclear industry and, and, and corporations, and he made promises then. And they didn't, I mean, none of the environmental groups had been made aware of it. All the nuclear lobbyists, the NEI nuclear in, you know, engineering industry, trade lobby was there, everybody was there, and none of the environmental groups were there or had knowledge that this was going to happen, and it was a handshake and it was a commitment that he was going to help move nuclear power forward because he thought it was a solution to climate change. Yeah. Um, so the same day that Keystone was canceled, that's he had this the day. Private, oh private meeting in the White House with 160 nuclear executives, oh. and, so, and the White House is committed to pursuing a lot of new nuclear technologies. So I just want to take a moment oh, as somebody who's yeah. concerned about climate change mm -hmm. and as a, definitely a lay person to summarize a few points that I heard from you. I realize it's coming out in a paper as I understand, mm -hmm. uh, the capstone project, uh, but the, here's how I understand it. One, it takes a long time to build a nuclear power plant. Two, it's usually expensive, about 20 billion, 19 billion. Uh, three, it uh, produces, um, uh, it's, um, it uses a lot of carbon, di releases a lot of carbon dioxide while building it. Four, in many cases, the taxpayers are paying for it. Five, uh, the profits go to the investors. Um, six, it's being promoted by a lot of political lobbyists that are supporting uh, political candidates to go for this, and I, I assume the media, mm. through the media, and uh, the liabilities are assumed by the taxpayers, 
and the health risks are underestimated and the disasters have been increasing in severity. Right. So I'm trying to get sort of a you bullet it. point. You got it. And point. you can't throw yes. out the trash. Right. <laughs> and, and, you can't, and you can't throw out the trash. trash. One more point, which and is you can't throw out the trash. And it's toxic it's from the beginning of the, of the... Yeah, well, uh, that's what I'm trying to say, you know, and it's, it's probably going, it could reduce eventually when built, a given plant could reduce carbon emissions within that area geographically about 20 percent, but to build it would have cost a lot of carbon emissions. And during the 40 years or, you know, well, at, at very best 20 mm -hmm. years it would take to build it, our parts per million will have gone up probably another 20 parts per million or 40 parts per million. And, and so our net gain with respect to climate change is at least is zero. Yeah, it's actually know, a negative. The, it's, right, it's, it's negative. Yeah. 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 And so, um, so when we look at um, climate at the nuclear industry, which you said you yourself at one point you were recommending it as a stepping stone between coal, which we don't like, and wind and solar you now have changed that mm -hmm. and also one other point that you mentioned the cost of building the renewables you know if we were to take that 20 billion dollars to make the nuclear power plant and put it into renewables we will get far uh you know m much more for our dollar yeah. 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 So I think yeah. I got it all. You got it all. Yeah. Right. You're right. Right. Do you like it? Like well, it. I put it on the on the video. Yeah. I think you left out, Lori, if there's a failure to yes. cost the people. No, I life. said that. Oh, you're but right. one yeah. thing I want to say from a health perspective, that cancer often takes about five years minimum, sometimes up to ten, to manifest. So our ability to track things is and cancers is lower. Mm -hmm. Some of you know. Some I know some of the plant, thyroid um, yeah, some of them are 15 and some of them can be 15 to 20 years out. Yeah. <coughs> so so our ability to assess it as a health risk is is limited. Does that mean that anyone is off the hook that might be a causation factor? Yep. Simply right. there's no liability. Yep. There's right. no liability. Right. Except the taxpayers, because you're oh, paying for the taxpayers. There's a, you know, I'm sure you've heard of this Price Anderson insurance. So, switch. so one of the things, and why we need to, why you're focusing on colleges and things like that, is young people who are waiting and hopefully surviving the 20 years while the plant is built and starting to pay into the costs, and and will not reap the profits, are the ones whose future is being mm -hmm. hurt. It's a generational transfer of risk, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Eco both <coughs> economic and environmental. Yeah, as well as a transgenerational effect on offspring. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. right. And, and so when will um, college students wake up to their future being hurt by mm -hmm. this? And High this is students. great. So, mm -hmm. so following for, through that, uh, Fairwinds is presenting at colleges and I guess um, other institutions, I assume. Yeah, we just did a presentation at Sonoma State last Wednesday. Yeah. And we have uh, Cal Poly, California Polytechnic, uh, next, the week after Thanksgiving. So in order to create the activist body, the activist body that some of us saw when we were young, you know, certainly against the Vietnam War, and et cetera, um, I, you know, Hopefully, some of these things will begin to awaken an activist body, which creates one part of the tripod of change. So you have you have an educational organization presenting an initiative, uh, you know, education about things. You have a group of dedicated activists who are really concerned about their health, and then hopefully we end up creating. Uh, you know, a political official running for office or, or a um, person currently in office who takes a stand. And I do want to let you know that with um, Marin Clean Energy right here in Marin, we had Charles McGlashan as your, your person in office 
We had a group of dedicated activists, and then we had also an educational program. We also had some good economic analysis of what uh, a green utility might be like paid for by taxpayer money, okay? And, and then with the stopping of the glyphosate use uh, or the Roundup use on the Marin Water District, again, we had a group of activists. We had an educational initiative, which was done a lot by Sunrise Center, actually. And we had Larry Bragman from the Marin Water District going for a pesticide and herbicide-free water district. And so I just wanted to present this because Fairwinds is playing the role of the nonprofit that's educating. So I myself am donating to them, and I really want to invite you to look at what you might want to donate today to help make this change, to help build this activist body that in, you know, that will begin to coalesce and, and end up creating some politicians who will be able to step forward. So, uh, you know, I invite you to think about what you might want to donate right now in, in cash, in checks, or whatever. It's tax deductible, <laughs> I want to let you know, and, and help make a difference. Thank you. So, you're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. We also, there's also a PayPal donate button on the site. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's good. Uh, I, when Fukushima blew, I thought that it They were able to pull the fuel out of the fuel pool at Unifor. Um, Unifor was, despite the fact there were three meltdowns going on, the biggest concern uh, was the fuel pool at Unifor for the first week, and it was beginning to boil dry. Here's another piece of luck. Um, it, the, the, if it had boiled dry, um, it, the contamination in the, in the you're talking about 700 nuclear bombs worth of stuff going up. Uh, the contamination in the northern hemisphere would have been atrocious, let alone Japan. Um, but what happened at Unifor um, is that uh, if here's a nuclear fuel pool, and over here was a, uh, a pool that held equipment underwater uh, because it was so radioactive. And they were refueling and doing some work on the reactor. Well, they were behind schedule by about two days, and the equipment from that pool had not been moved back into the nuclear reactor. If it had been, that pool would have been empty of water. And what happened when the, uh, when the earthquake hit, there was a, a, a wall called a divider plate that was held in by uh, compressed air. When they lost power, they lost compressed air, and the divider plate fell which allowed all of that water to run into the spent fuel pool. Wow. And two days later, that was scheduled to be drained. And had that not happened, you would have had the, 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 a complete boil off of all of the water in the fuel pool fire. Now that's just one more piece of this luck. I, you know, I could go on with these lucky coincidences that prevented uh, a disaster from becoming, I don't know, what's one rung up, a catastrophe. But you, you were, we were at the edge of a global catastrophe. Um, 
it, is it bad now? Yes, absolutely. But to think about a technology that could be so much worse were it not for luck and courage, um, it just boggles the mind. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your comments. But we are very well liked in Japan, uh, which is really special. Uh, that you know that we were probably the only site that the English-speaking Japanese could watch during the first couple of months of the accident. So yeah, thank and you. I, I was a protester at the Diablo Valley. Oh. oh, could you say a word about Diablo? Yeah, Diablo Canyon uh, is uh, the last uh, reactor operating in California. Um, and it's owned by Pacific Gas and Electric, the same people that blew up that gas main here in San Francisco. Um, it was designed in the 60s, and like I said, they, they uh, uh, reversed the blueprints and built the plant backward. Again. And, and then they had to completely rebuild it. And the process was that they, uh, uh, it, it wound up taking until 1985 for the plant to go online. In addition, when they built it, they hadn't discovered the Hosgree Fault and the Shoreline Fault. Um, and they built it so that the ground motion was for 0.4 Gs. And in fact, with the Hosgree and the Shoreline, it's at least 0.75 Gs. So the ground acceleration is twice as much as what it was built for. Um, hmm. Maggie and I and Fairwinds are consulting with uh, uh, Friends of the Earth on, on that and providing information to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They bent the rules uh, to allow the plant to be built. What they should have done when, when the uh, ground acceleration changed, it should have gone back into the public <coughs> um, for public comment and, and uh, in, back into the licensing process. Something called 10 CFR 5059. But it, neither Diablo nor the NRC wanted that to happen. So they both looked the other way, and the public never got involved in that issue of how the ground acceleration changed. Um, what the NRC allowed Diablo to do is, is change the numbers. Um, if anybody's ever had a British sports car, it knows that the shock absorbers are called dampers. But what Diablo did was they made the damping coefficients in the seismic analysis six times stronger than what they had designed it for. Without any evidence? Uh, Without any, any yeah. building? Well, see, that's the, prob the problem is that uh, technical experts outside the NRC couldn't, uh, can't answer that question because all of that is hidden from us. Why? Because proprietary. <clears throat> it, it's proprietary. proprietary, and unless the licensing process gets opened, uh, it's basically the priesthood, the NRC, looking at, uh, at, so, at Diablo. So we've never been able to answer that question. Is there a... a and what which organization is spearheading the efforts to try to have the Diablo license not renewed? Can you direct us? Well, the, the, well Friends of the Earth nationally, but Mothers for Peace. Mothers for and, Peace. And um, Rochelle Beckers is... Um, so if we want to support something, yeah. we do Mothers, Mothers for Peace. Mothers for Peace is Linda Seeley down in San Luis Obispo and Rochelle Eon. Becker. Ecological Options Network. Yes, e yes. Eon. 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 Yeah. That's right in uh, Bolinas. And I want to say um, the San Bruno fire um, occurred, the explosions occurred because of very conscious neglect from PG&E. PG&E was given money to repair their pipes and their systems and chose to give it to uh, bonuses to their executives. There are now 33 lawsuits against um, uh, PG&E right now. Uh, the main reason they're wondering about relicensing uh, the plant is that it would be a public relations nightmare because you have a company with a proven lack of ethics in many, many situations, then lobbying to continue their nuclear plant. So I think there's a value to um, to stepping forward about this for the sake of our own state. Mm -hmm. And of course, we, ha we are an earthquake state, so. Um. And, and there's a value also from um, the stance of disaster management. Mm -hmm. um, our board, one of our board members is a retired fire chief from California, and he lives in um, Pinot. And, uh, our daughter is a paramedic. She just 
stop being a paramedic because she's a full emergency room trauma nurse now. She was a paramedic for 10 years. Uh, four of those years were in Charleston, South Carolina, where a lot of radioactive material comes in through the Charleston port. Mm -hmm. They have um, Geiger counters on every ambulance. No one knows how to use them. No one is trained. I've spoken to uh, Robert M M Manning, the chairman of our board, about disaster management. No one he knows. No fire company, no ambulance corps, no one is trained in how to treat radiation, how to handle it. There's no suits for them. There's nothing. And this, these plants are, are so, cl they're old, they're leaking, and they're close to population areas. And you look back at what happened at 9-11, not just 3-11, the nuclear disasters, but 9-11. All of those emergency workers, these are, you know, your neighbors, your family, your friends, they're all really sick, really sick. That's true. And so you have to think about what's going to happen to all of us if one of these plants has a meltdown. Mm -hmm. At the end of our California tour, we're spending three days down in Burbank with a filmmaker who's doing a film um, about the electric grid system. And uh, there's a lot of research on this, and the where we started the tour in Truckee is one of the experts on the electric grid and that electromagnetic pulses um, and solar storms can destabilize the grid, and then there's no electricity for the pumps to run or anything to cool the reactors. So if there was a solar storm, if there was a terrorist attack or a cyber attack, which Ted Koppel just issued a book called, what's the name, is it Offline? I think it's Offline is the name of it. Just came out um, last week. And it talks about um, the electric grid being destabilized by cyber attacks. If any of mm. this happens, none of these reactors can be cooled. Yeah. I thought there was backup of yeah. diesel oh. motors for the for the coolant. You can well, cool. yeah, there's enough uh, diesel fuel on a nuclear site to run for seven days. That's it. And of course, if the you know if you've got mayhem out in the civilian world, the the question is how do you get new diesel fuel to the diesel? That's for a solar flare. Uh, an electromagnetic pulse in space from North Korea or somebody that decides to ignite one nuke in the uh, atmosphere about a, a hundred miles up would blow right through the station transformer and fry all of the integrated circuits. Oh my God. So, uh, you know, so a, a terrorist attack in the form of, you know, do we call North Korea a terrorist? I mean, they certainly have the missiles and the nuclear warheads and the way they could put a nuclear warhead in, in uh, space. It could uh, knock out the 80 nuclear plants on the, on the East Coast um, and, and knock out the grid for on the order of 10 years. This is, this is not a problem you recover from overnight. You know, so we, we've gotten a grid where it, we, we've gotten so big, each one of these power plants is huge. And that we needed to do that. When I was, when I was building power plants, nobody could have the computer networks to have thousands of little generators pulling together, but now we can do it, just like cell phones. We used to have a central switching part, you know? Uh, but, so that, that's just another uh, reason to go to a renewable grid, so that um, you you don't have all your eggs in right, yeah. and, uh, uh, actually, in space. And one other point you made to me at dinner was, um, if your power plant goes, your nuclear power plant goes out for, um, you, 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 you need to have quite a few smaller plants of another sort around to right. supply the energy for the area that has now lost its power. And, and that doesn't happen as a high With renewable, it, it, when you have large power plants, you have to keep a couple large power plants spinning all the time, even though they're not making electricity. So when that power plant fails, you, you don't lose power. But with the renewable grid of thousands of little generators, you don't have that problem. The, the most reliable grid in the world is Denmark. 
uh, and mm -hmm. they've got thousands of small generators. And the second most reliable grid is Germany, which has thousands of small generators. They're 10 times more reliable in Denmark and Germany than they are in the United States, which still relies on the large generators. So another reason to move to uh, renewables. Ah, is and speak, yeah. speak to what Germany is doing energy-wise. Yes. What's the most amount they've made from wind and solar? And what's well, happening in Texas right now? Yeah. Uh, okay. In Texas right now, um, power is free from 9 o'clock at night until 6 o'clock in the morning. Wow. They have so much excess coming off of the windmills that they give it away in, uh, from, in for those nine Texas. hours. Yes, in parts. <laughs> now, Amazing. Amory Lovins will tell you that uh, we don't need air conditioners in that case because at night you could be building blocks of ice which would then cool through cooling things so you, you can offset the, the heat of the day with the electricity. Uh, in Germany, uh, Angela Merkel was a very conservative politician and a physicist. And uh, of course, right after the, the Daiichi disaster, probably because you know, Germany was decimated by bombing and it's, it's, it's ingrained in their psyche, um, she decided to shut down every nuke in Germany uh, by 2022. Uh, nine shut down immediately that were the oldest, most like Fukushima, and the others are going to well, wean their way off the grid. But Germany. Uh, now, on a Sunday in Germany, back at the back in the middle of the summer, 85% um, of Germany's electricity came from renewables. Now it's 85 percent. 85 percent. It's exciting. Now it's a Sunday, and, the, and a lot of the businesses weren't running right. flat out. But uh, so that you know, the number is somewhat distorted. But think about it. 85 percent came from renewables uh, in a country that's just a couple years into this into this path. The book we wrote. Uh, it's called, uh, uh, in the English translation is Fukushima Daiichi, The Truth and the Way Forward. Um, and the truth was about the accident, but the way forward was about, uh, they, the Japanese had an opportunity to do what the Germans did, which was create a renewable paradigm that they could sell throughout the world. And it's interesting, the Germans decided to go down that renewable paradigm and, and Based on Fukushima Daiichi. Yeah. And they're certainly not dumb, and they're, they're going to figure out a way to make a lot of money uh, as they work through the teething problems of, of, of getting that grid to work. And the Japanese had that opportunity, and they just never, ever um, accepted the potential that they could become an export yeah, economy. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to say it's not going to be enough for us as a country to stop use of nuclear power if Westinghouse goes and sells all those power plants to India. It, it's still going to end up in our lungs. Yes, the radiation knows no borders. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And yeah. sooner or later, that's going to be a really, I mean, we think Fukushima is bad, but in a way, it's this horrible thing where only a really titanic disaster is actually going to switch this thing off unless yeah. we get that first. And point. unless we educate it's enough to right. reach right. out to and that's why we're doing a new this. Pop yeah. Yeah. populace. Right. So I just want to say, you can put your donations in <laughs> in this heart bowl, okay? Because I know you have a lot of heart for this work, as I'm sure I do, and I am, I'm contributing also on the internet because they have a nice PayPal site, and I can use my credit and card a regular for a much charge larger you donation. Like yeah. But I just invite you to to think of the fifty dollars or the hundred dollars or the twenty dollars or whatever you feel you can put for this evening. Thank you. And thank you so much. All right, thank you very All much. Right. Yeah. So I'll put the heart cell over here. And everyone, I want to just mention a couple local resources. If you want to get your food tested, there's International Medcom in Sebastopol. They set up a food testing station, so if you want to test Japanese tea or uh, seaweed or something like that. Can you say uh, that again more slowly? Can you say that again? Look for the website medcom.com. Or, or GeigerCounter.com, and those are run by International Medcom in Sebastopol, and they have a oh, that's great. Uh, they have uh, uh, a food testing uh, station there, radioactive food testing station there, and they make uh, personal Geiger counters that are anywhere from three hundred dollars to seven hundred dollars. I'm getting a new one called an Onyx, mm -hmm. which is a Bluetooth uh, iPhone one that ties into SafeCast. The, the radiation detection network in Japan. Uh, so if you're going to travel to Japan, definitely tune in to SafeCast. 
Uh, but if you, have, if you want local resources, you can tune in to me. I'm ed at sunrisecenter.org, and I'll post this video on the Sunrise Center website right. and, and uh, YouTube channel. Thank you. And uh, just remember for your larger checks, uh, you can uh, make it tax deductible, you know, very easily. And if you want to leave a check in that zone. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.